passive investing works and it works really well when you are just filling the bathtub with money, holding rates at zero, actually honing in on the top quality names in momentum in markets like this, that is more meaningful. And so I think having a buy strategy and a sell strategy is really important when you are sorting through new waves of technolo technological advances. So joining us now on Speak Up on the Wealthion Network is none other than Nicole Webb. Uh, she's a vice president of financial advisor at Wealth Enhancement Group, but she's also a five-star money manager. And, and Nicole, you are obviously a brilliant person, so I want to get right into it with you. Thank you for joining us. Let's start with your career a little bit, because I think it's a fun Great. You've had this great odyssey to where you are now. You grew up in Philadelphia. Take us a little bit through your career before I start peppering you with economic questions. Yeah. Um, my career is uh, it's inter it's, a, it's a fun backdrop and you hit on part of it in that I am the coming together of a, a woman who grew up on a turkey farm in rural Minnesota and an inner city street thug from Philadelphia. And I mean, he wasn't really a thug, but um, higher education was an aspiration, like really part of the American dream and one that neither of them uh, had the luxury of achieving. And so as their firstborn child, that trajectory of going to college was really important to them. And I thought school was really boring and I didn't want to do it. And long story short, my mother sat me down and said, hobbies are the luxury of those who have career success and you need to keep going. You're good at math, focus on finance, you know, just like go. Um, and so that's really it. It wasn't this, this dream of, you know, Wall Street that it wasn't in me at 16, 17, 18. Um, and so I don't, I don't know that I have this great aspirational story other than you just put your head down and you you work really hard. Um, and it has taken me incredible places. And finance has become the thing that I'm obsessed with talking about. So here we are uh, 20 years later. I celebrated my 20th work anniversary at Wealth Enhancement Group this past September. And it's been an incredible ride. Um, touched a lot of parts of advisory and markets. Um, I'm pretty happy with where I am now. All right. Well, congratulations. So I got to ask the follow up question here. Yeah. What are the hobbies? Because I know you're <laughs> successful. Yeah. And so your, mom, your mom and I want to know what the hobbies are. What are your hobbies? Yeah. Well, I like doing really hard things, like physically hard things. So okay. hiking mountains, okay. running. Um, so anything that just looks like it would be kind of excruciating, that would be a pure are joy. You, and then are you like a rock climber? <laughs> I would, no, not rock climber. I'm actually not probably that mm -hmm. physically embodied. But um, my partner in life likes to live off the grid for the month of September and hunt large game with bow and arrow. And so we do a lot of training for that kind of uh, wilderness activity. So right. yeah. that's my kind of person. So I'm, yeah. I, my family is originally from uh, northeastern Pennsylvania. So from the age of nine, uh, the Friday after Thanksgiving, we were out in the middle of nowhere hunting. See, so, uh, you know, I totally appreciate that. And that's, uh, that's part of that life experience that thankfully, we got to uh, enjoy as kids. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to transition abruptly. Yeah. Well, uh, the Fed's got some big decision making going. Tell us about the state of the economy. I'm going to put you in the seat. You're on the Fed board. Let's make you the Fed chair. <laughs> You're looking at all this economic data. You're a data dependent person. Yeah. Where should we go? And uh, uh, so there are two questions here. Where should we go? But mm -hmm. then also, where do you think they're going to go? Yeah. And is it different from where where we should go? It's interesting. You know, I think the, the past couple of weeks, um, the data hasn't necessarily been in alignment with the street's expectations. And we used to be so reflexive, you know, to data. Every bit of data caused a massive reflex. And instead, what you're seeing is really very few ripples uh, through the market today. I think a lot of that signaling is that, and we go all the way back to December, what's been quoted as the Fed pivot, 
And we in December, there was this bit of euphoria that the Fed was going to take us through this easing cycle um, in 2024. And you started to see maybe the beginnings of a theme around broadening. And then we entered earnings season. So we're going to fast forward now. We're in the, the first couple of months of 2024. And it was still all eyes on leading into earnings season. We needed so many Fed cuts to achieve the 10, 11% earnings growth that was baked into S&P um, expectations. And so instead, what we got was earnings data, which is kind of more important than economic data in terms of how we follow profits and profitability of companies that said, we've already achieved maybe five, five plus percent of that earnings growth expectation and forward looking rest of year 2024 and into 2025 actually looks pretty good. And so there's been a lot of discipline taking inside of US corporations in the last couple of years. And so I think that gives us more wiggle room for the data to be a little bit seasonal in January and February before there's any type of seismic event or a, a big ripple in calling this a theme. Okay, so I have this whole theory. I want to test it on you. You tell me if I'm right or wrong. I feel like the Fed and the government, so the monetary and fiscal policy went bonkers during COVID. Understandably so. I'm not yeah. I'm not a Monday morning quarterback. They didn't know what was going to happen. Yeah. They told people to go into their houses. A lot of blue collar people couldn't work yeah. as a result of that. So they inducted money into the marketplace to help people, yeah. uh, help businesses, so on and so forth, uh, float their boat. Uh, this left a lot of cash in the system, higher yeah. than expected savings. And yeah. now that we're clearing COVID, for the most part, we've cleared COVID. We're back uh, working again all of this money is still sluicing around in the global economy and has led to economic growth in the United States. China, not as much. Mm -hmm. They're fighting with the West. The sanctions are hurting them, or I shouldn't say sanctions, let's say tariffs. Yeah. Uh, and also they have their own internal problems related to COVID and their healthcare system. So you're in a situation, the U.S. is growing, yep. uh, but the rest of the world, not as much as the U.S. Yep. Of course, you and I both know the Federal Reserve is not just the Federal Reserve for the U.S., but because of all these dollars that are floating out there, we're sort of the global Federal Reserve. Yeah. And so you cut the rates? You cut the rates in uh, June? You cut the rates in July? What do you do? My expectation would be that there is a, I think of it like, sh sh like shaving meat. I mean, you shave it thin. Um, and I do believe that they will test the waters. You know, Bostic was... Um, very forthright in saying, you know, rate cuts at this time would, and I'm paraphrasing, essentially reaccelerate demand, and the reacceleration of demand reignites that in those inflationary pressures. At the same time, though, we have historical events that show that kind of those that slow trimming of rates um, is a very prudent approach, and one that is that best serves you so you don't push yourself into that recessionary environment. And so with economic growth remaining above expectation, we bring back up that fear of the Fed waiting too long, but then kindly Powell on his second day of testimony gave us that, I believe the data is leading us there sooner rather than later. And so I think this all very much falls in alignment. To some of the points that you just made, I think it, we have to do a really good job when we think about investing in companies and talking about the economic data of countries and not overly drawing them together. There's such a, a mashing right now of economic events and Wall Street events. And at the end of the day, and, and I believe this is true even more in an election year, we invest in companies, not countries. And as cliche as that might sound, I believe that people who are investing wealth need to remind themselves of that because there can be two truths at the same time. There can be the truth of uh, acceleration of money supply, and there can be the long and variable legs of the great financial crisis all playing out in tandem with the acceleration of debt in this country that was you know, kind of per precipitated by the great financial crisis and then some of the ongoing policy on, on the backside of that. At the same time and in truth, you can offset debt with growth. 
And so when we look at the backdrop of deglobalization happening and the onshoring as a result of COVID, you also can kind of play out, okay, well, that, that spikes up unit labor costs, that spikes up unit production costs, and we have productivity increasing. And so that brings us back to the monetization of spend on AI and some of the kind of forward technologies. Um, and so I think it's, it's, a, it's a really opportune time to be a long-term investor as long as you can kind of separate two truths happening in parallel. Right, it's interesting. So, so let's go to that and then I wanna talk a little bit about stocks and get your advice there and then some advice for people that are trying to get a, uh, uh, a nest egg together and they want to grow their nest egg. But let's let's talk about this issue. So we've got $34 trillion of debt. Mm-hmm. So let's just frame it for everybody. George Washington to George W. Bush, $7 trillion of debt. Yep. Yep. Barack Obama, Donald Trump, Joe Biden, $27 trillion of yep. debt. Yep. And so is that sustainable? Uh, should we borrow $16 trillion over the next four years, which it looks like the CBO is saying that the U.S. is going to do that. Yeah. Uh, is that something that we should worry about as investors or is that something? No, no problem. Dick Cheney's right. Deficits don't matter. I, I mean, deficits matter. <laughs> but, uh, you know, at the end of the day, in its simplest form, I'd love to believe that the, the U.S. is run like the strongest most profitable business in the world. And so when we think today about what's in momentum and what's quality, a lot of that has to do with the taking of the medicine. And so when you see, uh, and I'll just use the backdrop and the intersection of big Wall Street names with the question you just asked, one of the reasons we saw duration assets, mega technology clobbered at the end of calendar year 2022 was a lot of these issues that we're talking about right in parallel to the u.s economy and it was the lack of discipline the lack of taking of their medicine the lack of shoring up how they were spending and cleaning some of that up and so i think you can draw that over to when we think about the u.s as an economy and the head of the the world economic table who really sits there um, there's a lot of privilege that we have in in how we're allowed to manage um, our balance sheet versus other countries. And I think that to be just kind of without political sentiment, just a true statement. I do believe in, in my office, you know, with wealthy families, we talk a lot about what debt should mean to them as a backdrop of how to be an investor or how to think about their own financial planning. And the reason for that being that if we know that government debt can really only be offset by three kind of core pillars, inflation or deflation of US dollar, taxation and growth. You can start to really think about how one wants to align their chess pieces in playing out the next decade. So we can't, we cannot change the past, the past is. And so when we think about where we sit today, we see the opportunity in a couple of things. One, the Fed has the opportunity to pull the short end of the yield curve down. And that will be meaningful in servicing debt. The right. second part of that will be though this longer servicing of the debt. And that's where you start to think about taxation and growth. And we, so we see productivity playing in, we see the backdrop of deglobalization, and then we have to start really kind of honing in on taxation and what that means as an expense item for corporations that we invest in, but then also for wh- how one manages their personal wealth. So you don't seem too worried about the deficit then, am I right? I think that I can only worry about the deficit to the extent that I have control over planning around it. I would say as an individual, I have I have concerns as an advisor to individuals. I would say that all I can do is advise them, given what is known and and what the highest likelihood of kind of events would be. I think that the Elizabeth Warrens of the world will say that- My favorite and, person, by the way, Elizabeth Warren. Like, <laughs> I think she's- at the, She's at the apex of my favorite people. Yeah, so, well, I think she's gonna continue to be very loud and vocal that yeah. who cares, just tax people when they're dead. Dead people are a great place to go collect our tax revenues. It's not an inflationary pressure, just go after, go in that direction. And I mean, those are the ways 
um, that I sincerely speak to my clients about navigation. It's like who who is has the loudest soapbox for how we're going to offset debt? Because right now it doesn't look like anybody is terribly concerned about going from where we are and reverting off course. And so yeah. if, if they don't, they have to raise the revenue somewhere. Yeah. All right. So let's so talk about stocks. Yeah. All right. But before we talk about stocks, let's talk about the uh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Joe Smith yeah. who are building a nest egg. They're nervous about the stock market. They're nervous about the bond market. But you and I have been in the industry a long time. We know this is the path to prosperity. So make the pitch to Mr. and Mrs. Joe Smith. What do they do with their money? How should they think about their money? And give me a five or 10 year plan for somebody generically yeah. uh, to grow their nest egg and to create some uh, financial security and independence. I would say that in the last 20 years, I mean, to anybody who walked into my office today, I would say in the last 20 years, this is an ideal time to be setting yourself up for multi-generational success, um, that there is a decade plus of runway here. Even today, we have the two-year treasury pushing back up above 465. I mean, you have risk-free assets in that kind of mid to long duration, giving you, you know, more than 100 basis points over the long-term inflation rate. That's meaningful. And so when you look at the concentration of wealth in the baby boomer generation, you know, we should believe that there continues to be demand in fixed income across fixed income spectrum. So whether that continue to be treasury when municipalities, strong municipalities are incentivized to underwrite good debt again. And then when we look at, um, you know, at, at corporate debt today, it looks really enticing. And I haven't been able to say that for almost 15 years. On the flip side, you have a market that hasn't really broadened out. And so if you were to just focus on U.S. equities, I mean, I can make a strong case for, you know, the mid cap sector and the fact that we have, again, I'm going to bring up this backdrop of deglobalization and 20 percent of the mid cap index is industrial companies. We have congressional spend going back to our conversation about spend around Build Back Better, the Infrastructure Act, the CHIPS Act. That's all happening here, and it all takes industrial investment. Um, and then when you look at the large cap part of the market, this isn't 2021. We're not, we don't see this massive run up in unprofitable companies. We're seeing, um, we're seeing expansion in profitable companies. And so there, and there's a lot to go forward. I mean, when we look at pharmaceuticals, when we think about the changing backdrop of currency and banking, um, and then you layer on top of that technology advancements. And yes, there's big CapEx spending right now on the future of AI, but that, that monetizes at some point and in a lot of different ways. Um, so even to think just in terms of traditional, um, you know, stocks, bonds, real estate, and cash, I mean, you can make a really strong argument for this being a great time to be a cross-asset investor. And that has not historically been the case since the onset of the great financial crisis. And so, um, I mean, it excites me every day for people. Normalizing rates, rates getting back into that normal trend line from the 1990s and pre-2008 is sort of a good thing for the investor class. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. It was so, there was hyper fixation on the long and variable legs of inflation and COVID policy. And I'm sorry, but I would say it is the long and variable legs of holding rates at zero. Gotcha. And to an extent, I think in the rear view mirror, we will be grateful for the part of inflation that was transitory, that pushed the hand of normalizing rates um, versus staying at this, we're just going to fill the bathtub with water and, you know, kind of just leave rates at zero. So everything has the opportunity to appear profitable. That's that's not helpful. Right. I think it's well said. It also creates more of a stock picking market than just an index based market. Yes. Um, we're going to take some questions from our audience, which is the fun part of the show. And so I'll ask the producers to pop up the first question. Assuming the central banks normalize interest rates, does the buy and hold strategy need changing for a true tactical asset allocation with, with a flexible cash component? So this is right in your wheelhouse, and it's literally right what you're saying. 
Thank you, Joe from Ontario. What do you say there, Nicole? I mean, as long as Joe is talking about normalizing rates back to uh, something around kind of three, three and a half, I would say mm -hmm. buy and hold quality growth oriented companies. And there's a lot of opportunity in those today. Um, I also think that, you know, it was globalization that helped us bring unit production costs, unit labor costs down. As we shift forward, there's a lot of opportunities for even these, you know, long-standing names um, to actually mm -hmm. see real profitability growth through the digitization and the CapEx spend in technology. Um, when it comes to buy and hold, though, and something you just said, Anthony, um, passive investing works and it works really well when you are just filling the bathtub with money, holding rates at zero, actually honing in on the top quality names in momentum in markets like this, that is more meaningful. And so I think having a buy strategy and a sell strategy is really important when you are sorting through new waves of technolo technological advances. Okay, that's a great answer. We're going to go to the next question. Hey, Mooch, I saw Steve Mnuchin is allegedly putting together a plan to buy TikTok. What are your thoughts? And so, Nicole, I want you to chime in as well, and I'll be brief. Jessica from Ohio, uh, my thoughts are this is very necessary. Unfortunately, when you work in the American government and you're privy to some of the intelligence details about what our adversaries are trying to do here in the United States, and in terms of the manipulation of data and algorithms that could in effectively impair our youth, I think it is very, very necessary to take that asset and put it back in the control of the American people. And something that Mr. Mnuchin, Secretary, former Secretary Mnuchin said, is that the Chinese would never allow a U.S. entity to own this type of social media uh, application in their country. And unfortunately, that's just the world we live in. So I predict that this will get sold to either Stephen or another group like his, uh, and it'll be a successful outcome. I don't think anybody wants TikTok to go away. We certainly want there to be vibrant competition uh, for Facebook and other social media platforms. But we do have to get it taken out of the hands of somebody that's manipulating that data and that is adversely affecting the interests of the United States. What say you, Nicole? I mean, you know, I'll speak kind of two hats as I, I do believe there should be competition um, as a mother and as an, as an American citizen. You know, there is no denying the strength of the algorithms. Um, and so for me personally, I would say that onshoring data in an, in an Oracle cloud storage facility in the U.S. isn't enough. We know that that's not enough. We know that there's a long reach between where data is stored and how it's accessed um, without knowing enough about whether or not we can truly, you know, actually get the sale of TikTok to go through. It seems to me incredibly necessary. Uh, and and you saw the, I mean, you saw the vote yesterday, only 64 people were against this. I mean, mm -hmm. so those who hold the intelligence are obviously very much in alignment with this is something that is meaningful and important. Okay, totally agree. And let's go to the next one. What are your thoughts on platforms like Robinhood that offer free trading in exchange for payment for order flow? This is from Alex. And I'm going to embarrass myself. MS is Missouri. Am I right about that? I think so. I mean, okay. I don't want to jointly be embarrassed with you. That would be my guess. While you're answering the question, I'm going to go back to my fifth grade geography class. I'm going to look it up. But I'm go like, ahead. I'm like, if this is Mississippi, I feel mortified in public. I sort of feel like it is, actually. But You know, um, you know free, tr I, free trading in exchange for payment order flow. Okay, so this is Mississippi. It's it my is Mississippi. Alex, I'm sorry. Okay. There you I'm go. In, See, I was really, I was New like, York. I would have had to phone. Us, I would have had to phone New a New Yorkers friend. know nothing, right? Us, us New Yorkers know nothing. Uh, I would say the, 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 the free gets people, I mean, look at the assets on the platform. If free is what incentivizes people to participate in the profit of the companies that they are willing to invest in, then it exactly. is, then it's worth it. Who cares right. if it's an exchange for payment order flows? 
companies deserve to make money if they can bring in consumers so that consumers don't feel nickel and dime. I don't know if what I'm buying on Amazon is really cheaper anymore, but what I do know is they're not making me pay a shipping cost. And so it's like, perfect. I'm happy for it. This happens in a lot of different ways. And I believe that the outcome is actually for the good. Yeah, not so for I'm, the I'm with you. If you're a long-term investor, you can use Robinhood, but whatever frictional costs that you're yeah. getting in the front end, you'll more than make up on the back end. And I think we have to be long-term in our orientation as investors. So I like Robinhood and it's Alex from Mississippi. I'm sorry about that, but I mean, I'm a New Yorker, so you'll have to forgive me. Let's go to the next question. I'm really in a high dividend ETFs. There are a handful that are attractive to me. What am I missing? And that's Holly from Kansas. That one I do know. So what do you say to Holly, Nicole? I'd say that you'd be missing out on opportunity in other sectors. I, I, I think that, you know, receipt of cash flow from your investments is one leg of a stool. Um, in the, the words high dividend also, you know, just gives me kind of, there's a lot of high dividend names and I don't want to pick on anyone, but you also kind of have to look at what is the business model and what is that, what is, what are you giving up in exchange for the dividend? And so when you think just as an example about, kind of the returns you've seen in the build out of AI infrastructure. I mean, that those are not dividend companies and that will spill over into the next leg of how one monetizes AI. And so I don't think it's bad for a portion, but I wouldn't, that wouldn't be where I'd go with all of my money, certainly. Okay, that's a great answer. Let's go to the next one. If y'all already have a well diversified portfolio and I have some extra funds to play with, I would like to start investing in startups. Where should I start? This is Brandon. Now, I don't recognize that state abbreviation, so maybe you do. You know, but I'm a New Yorker. I, so I don't read it. <laughs> I don't know what NJ. I don't think trains go there, so I'm not. All right, see not that? That's true New York. Okay. All right, so you're a Philadelphian. That's why you're saying that. Uh, All right, from New Jersey, what do you say to Brandon from New Jersey? You know, the start startup space is tricky because you're looking at companies that are likely not profitable and generally perform. So that's a hard one. And there's a lot, you know, there's 50 percent less companies that are publicly traded now than than there there once was. And so there's a lot held in the private markets today, especially startups. Um, what I do think is valuable is kind of digging a bit deeper. I it, the amount of time I spend right now trying to be um a tech nerd is really impressive to me i mean i'm trying to understand all of the veins of where we are headed with the applications of new technology and so i'd say i don't know that you necessarily need to invest in startups but you can think about the themes today where you haven't seen kind of this run-up in valuations because we're not we're not openly talking about the narrative of that next layer. Um, and that's generally just as profitable uh, as kind of trying to find the next great thing versus the next theme of something that's already started. So it's interesting. And I'll say something that doesn't reflect well on me. Uh, I've invested in a lot of startups and I've had a lot of startups fail on me. Mm -hmm. I always wonder, Nicole, if I had just taken the money I was putting in these startups and bought a Berkshire Hathaway or bought a Microsoft, yep. would me and my family be better? So I'm not saying you shouldn't do yep. a little bit of it because it's fun and yep. there's an opportunity to go on the golf course and say that I caught something very early. Yep. Uh, but I like uh, the go, go slow turtle approach to investing. Uh, but I appreciate the question, Brandon. Yep. Let's go to the next question. A lot of YouTube investing content seems to be weighted towards despair as if the world is about to end. Should we really be this concerned? This is Shira from Florida. And I will say this, you know, I, when I joined the Wealthy on Network, I said, I don't want to be that gloom and doom person. You can garner ratings as a gloom and doom person, but I'm an aspirational person. I'm an optimistic person. And I want to teach people that they can be aspirational and optimistic about the growth of their wealth, uh, which has helped me and my family and so many people that I'm close to. What do you say, Nicole? Uh, I think it goes back to the power of algorithms it, and whatever you hit on will continue to appear for you. And so I think uh, YouTube is a great platform for also finding a lot of 
the, the positive narratives too. Um, and I, I just put that out there because um, I think it's important to go in search of the other side of the story. Um, there are certainly a lot of things to be concerned about in the world today. And I don't want to come across as someone who like only has sunshine and rainbows and rose colored glasses and the debt doesn't matter and it's a bull market. And at, there are there are all of the issues that are omnipresent on the global landscape and certainly even here. What I would say, though, is that um, the strength of the U.S. comes from the strength of the business that is here and our ability to invest in those businesses. And that is a unique privilege. And we offer a lot of transparency in this country. Um, it might not feel transparent enough to a lot of people, but there is a lot of transparency. When you work on Wall Street, you follow the guidance because you believe the guidance. Like we talk a lot about uh, that side of things. And I don't want anyone to lose sight of uh, the benefit of that. That is why there is such strong asset flows to to the U.S. That's why valuations are so strong on U.S. domiciled companies. Um, and there's room for continued growth. The unique thing about humans is that we continue to innovate and we continue to capitalize on those innovations. And so it's meaningful to not let those despair narratives bring you down. I also think that it's forward thinking to talk about um, the flip side or the threats because it makes you a more balanced investor. If you can live at the intersection of despair and optimism, that's where you're going to find your best laid plan because you're not going to over respond to fear or greed narratives because you will live in the middle. Um, and so I would just encourage everyone to digest both ends and then live as closely to the center line as they can. I want you to take over my job as a host of this show, Nicole. Okay, that was, a, that was a brilliant answer, and that is exactly what I think we should stand for on this show, and frankly, on the Wealthy on Network. Okay, it is yes, there are good and bad things in the market. There are cycles, uh, but think like a Warren Buffett, think like a Nicole Weber, uh, get in there and own pieces of these companies for the long pull, and you'll be very well rewarded. Let's see if there are any more questions. Nicole is a hunter, can take down a buck with a bow and arrow. Mooch, can you do that or have you gotten too soft? This is Mike <laughs> Dave in the control. I, I think there's a new YouTube uh, video about to hit this fall and it's going to be you and I on an elk hunt. <laughs> you think that? I, you know, let me tell you something. I, I you know, I, I've gutted bu uh, bucks, I've dragged them out of the woods, I've tied them to the car. Yeah. Uh, but I will admit to Mike and Dave, that I'm going in for male breast reduction surgery at this point in my life because I am getting very soft, okay? And that's their way of going after me and letting me know there are no more questions, Nicole. Oh. So let's, let's give you the last word on Speak Up. Yeah. What else would you like to talk about before we uh, say goodbye and wish everybody a good weekend? You know, the, the other thing that I think is important today is um, kind of this antitrust narrative and um, not letting the big get too big. And so mm -hmm. we've spent running into this year uh, and a lot of last year was so hyper-focused on six or seven names. Um, there are great stories beneath the surface of companies that are either still held private or maybe not as well known. Um, the big are really big. And at the same time, um, they can't buy up everything anymore because of antitrust. And so I would just say, you know, don't lose sight of the fact that we eventually have to rotate out of semis and into hardware um, and that processing speeds and the way that our enterprise level um, operations run, that will all change again. And it's been a while since we talked about hardware. Um, and so again, I just, I would like to leave investors with this theme of, yes, NVIDIA has really run. And it seems like where NVIDIA goes, the market goes. But that is an old story. We used to talk that way about Apple. I can name countless names before it. Um, don't feel like you can't be an investor because some names have taken over the market narrative. It is still there's still so many viable under the surface um, companies to be invested in that are going to um, reap the rewards of what is happening, you know, kind of at that headline level today. I mean, it's a great way to end this show. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Nicole Webb, 
from Wealth Enhancement. I want to thank you for joining the show. And I really do hope you invite me on one of those hunts. It's happening. I'm gonna course, next time I see you in a green room, I'm gonna be like, let's get this date book. I want to surprise these humans with my prowess. Okay. It's gonna be the best content I've ever made. I can't wait. All right. God bless you, Nicole. All Have right, a great weekend. You. Okay. Thank you thank again. You.